That was good. <clears throat> So, uh, Padmasambhava and uh, Lopan uh, <clears throat> Shantarakshida were, were credited with the founding of uh, Samye in Tibet, first uh, monastery practice center. Hear me okay? Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, Buddha Dharma uh, was in. Himalayan regions, um, Tibetan uh, regions, you know, had to be way before that, right? Um, you just can't start something that quickly if there's no support whatsoever. There had to be support from Trisum Detson, the king, and um, the uh, aristocracy, right? Like, <laughs> had to, because <laughs> you got to build things, right? And um, Make it work. Um, one version of the story is um, Shantarakshida, who, by the way, some of us um, for the Dharma program uh, are reading his um, text on uh, you know, the adornment and uh, with commentary by Nipa Murshe, which I highly recommend. So <clears throat> uh, some people think, well, he. Uh, Shantarakshida had some trouble, uh, or maybe um, the other aristocracy, um, Bon or whoever, and so he had to ask um, uh, Guru and Shay to come, you know. Um, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I'd like to offer a little bit alternative possibility. Um, to uh, establish a monastery or practice center, build one from scratch, um, you need someone who's like done it before and um, you know has uh, an administrative interests and capabilities and um, has the uh, textual and language uh, strengths. Um, uh, and by administrative, not just having uh, deciding like when should we do this or when should we do that, but um, administration is resolving disputes and uh, you know um, how much grain to buy <laughs> and uh, all those kinds of things you know that um, uh, do not happen magically. So some of the stories uh, are. Uh, what, what was built um, in the day would be torn down by evening. <laughs> I have that experience right here. <laughs> so then I, and we all do like what we create and then it kind of disintegrates, you know, it's like we're starting up programs or we're kind of doing this or doing that. And then there's kind of enthusiasm maybe. And then, you know, then sometimes like, where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was going strong, and now you know. Um, so the the um, the inner nature of the story, of course, I think is is more important than what happened historically, which we won't know. But um, my guess is, like anybody trying to establish things, like um, things were started, and people said, "Yeah, I'll donate money for that." Show up, you know. Shantaraksha would show up and like for the donors meeting, had to have a donors meeting and you know, the aristocracy still do, you know, same old. And there was like one person or something. Uh, so uh, he was familiar with that, right? He was very familiar with that world. Um, so I, I don't think that's why he was interested in having um, Padmasambhava, you know, join him. Um, my my revisionist story, and you can have your own, and we can have a discussion. But um, uh, building things and translating things and establishing discipline um, gives, gives an abbot uh, 
very little time, you know, for like one-on-one, -on -one. very little time to do yogic training, right? Very little time or zero, right? Um, it's kind of a group, it's kind of a group talk, you know, situation. And my guess is uh, Shantarakshita being a really incredible teacher, um, which slapped all the way from a nice ad in India, um, thought maybe he could do it all. But um, there was so much to do. Uh, they said, you know, I, I do not have time to teach everybody uh, the highest level teachings. I don't have you know, time to teach you know, highest yoga tantra, maybe your Dzogchen. So uh, I'm going to start, you know, bringing my friends like Padmasambhava and Vimal Mitra, so like that. Um, so there's a little bit of division, right? Um, not, uh, it just kind of happens naturally. So um, obviously something got established and um, things uh, went well. But my guess is that um, uh, Chandra Akshida realized, okay, I, I, I can't do one-on-one -on -one things with people and do administration and get the language skills going and discipline five monks and you know meet with the king and <laughs> do all that stuff. So um, he he called his yogic friend, his Mahasiddha friend, um, uh, to help him out, and they worked they worked well together. That's my guess. Here at Lines are I uh, I've had to do you know a lot of it, right? So um, the uh, yogic instructor and fundraiser and administrator conflict resolver person that I'm able to bring in a wonderful administration here and be able to bring in uh, wonderful teacher friends, colleagues who um, can add to it, right? <clears throat> So one of those people that we're um, going to be hosting in just uh, how many days time? Yeah, 11 yeah. days. Um, Councilor Rimshe, so is um, going to give some teachings on um, what has become to be known as six yogas of Naropa. Um, Technically, now Chudruk, which means six dharmas of Naropa, but somebody early on said six yogas and it's stuck. And I think it's okay. You know, it's like, yeah, we do yoga too, right? Yeah. So he's going to give some introductory teachings um, and uh, may uh, also give uh, a short introductory uh, initiation or maybe just uh, Udung. I don't know. We'll see. Um, the uh, uh, basic uh, kind of public teachings overview of six yogas. I think he's done a little bit done online in the past, right? This was definitely last year. Anybody listening? Yeah, all right. Zima, Doug, okay. Um, I don't think we've recorded those, unfortunately. And um, did we? No. Maybe, maybe Dirk would know, but um, uh, some of that may be familiar to people that were listening then, but that was a small audience, don't you think? Not, not big, right? How many people? Yeah, so. <clears throat> you know, then it was COVID time and he was in Nepal and now he's in States, so wonderful opportunity, right? Then uh, I'm hoping we'll have uh, him talk Sunday, like this kind of talk, and then maybe even a uh, uh, Friday night um, talk, right? Friday the 19th, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll be blasting that. 
the scheduling has been quite flexible. So <laughs> unpredictable and spontaneous. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I should say the the Guru Rimshe side of me, if I could use those kind of terms, that's great. Like cool. Like just do whatever. We don't even, you know, um, show up at two o'clock in the morning, you know, the administration part of me goes, okay, we have to, you know, send out um, and let people know because people have to change or modify their schedules, right? Um, um, I haven't had um, uh, you know, finalized a few things with comes from Shay, but um, I'll just put out my preferences and bias. Um, the, um, the actual, um, if we do an actual initiation, it will be restricted, right? It'll be, uh, you know, to those people who I believe are, can benefit from the yogas and those people that will actually do them. That shouldn't be so strict. I mean, shouldn't we, I shouldn't even have to say that, but um, to um, be very classical, that's that's the way to do it. <clears throat> uh, um, the public initiations that um, you've been to, and even here, even kind of restricted, you know, maybe in refuge, but in the temple, you've done a lot, but um, they're, they're also very private initiations, right? Meaning like kind of hand-picked and that's very traditional. <clears throat> the number of people that can actually do is do highest yoga tantra and have the time and the motivation and doing Dzogchen is very small, you know? I don't know why that is, but maybe my theory is that it's like pyramid. You need a lot of people doing uh, a lot of basic practices to, you know, turn out a few Mozarts, right? You know, like that. <clears throat> but I'll have some more information on that. Um, but uh, maybe at the end of the hour here, I'll get some kind of show of hands to see. Definitely people um, should come on the Saturday, the 20th. And, um, you know, definitely uh, come on Sunday. <laughs> I would say, please invite uh, everybody you know for Friday night. <clears throat> so, um, Rinpoche and I have some, um, you know, commonalities, you know, which is nice. Um, I like to think uh, a sense of humor. <laughs> uh, but uh, like him, uh, he he has, of course, all the Gilead training, but also uh, lots of Kargu and Yingma training, as I have, and likes to teach from this uh, integrated point of view. That's neat, right? So, with, you know, um, sometimes, uh, sometimes the word is rime, which means non-biased. Uh, rime means not that you throw everything into a big stew, but rime means you're, you're appreciating, you know, the different approaches and how they harmonize, but you're not like just saying everything is everything, right? Otherwise, um, that, that's not a very interesting meal, right? Everything is everything becomes after you like eat it and ends up in your stomach. But I want to taste the difference between, you know, my carrot and my, you know, onion, right? So. Councilor <clears throat> Rapshay's teachings are, you know, traditional, but also very experiential. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to what he has to say, I've received many teachings and done retreats on six yogas myself, and of course on um, the Salon Tigle, which I'm doing um, this afternoon also. So uh, there'll be an interesting uh, yogic experience. Um, so, so far the yogic, my yogic experience of Rim Sheikh's coming is, is very broad and feels really happy. My, my administrative experience, like organizing it, uh, I just want to run away, but uh, we will. <laughs> Not again, you know. <laughs> I'm used to it, actually. 
I'm used to it, but um, <laughs> uh, actually, lines are here. We're fairly administratively, we're fairly predictable, don't you think, Susan? Which is great. I mean, it is so, it is uh, actually monastery style is quite predictable, really, you know, you know, because in the relative world, we have to make plans, right? You know, and, until we all learn to buy, locate, be two places at the same time, you know, we, we need, <laughs> that's the yogic side, you know, we, we still need to say, okay, well, um, I was planning on doing something Friday night, the 19th, but now I'd really like to go, or I, I didn't even know about you know, this, so um, I do want to have a good turnout, but um, I also realize that the number of people that have the energy and the time and the sensitivity to do, um, you know, inner teachings is few. So, <clears throat> so I think like Guru Rinpoche, um, uh had uh, kind of classically, we'd say, um, twenty-five students, right? Did I get that number correct? Twenty-five, twenty-five, yeah. Um, that is an immense number of people to train, to build the trust, to build the confidence, to have the, you know, uh, vulnerability, to have the time to spend with. You know, 25 people, huge, huge number. And of course, you know, probably his uh, preeminent student, Yeshi Tsogyal, right? Had to spend a lot of time with Yeshi Tsogyal. I mean, there's only so much time. <clears throat> So uh, 25 people is, is a huge number of people that are really inner people that are close to um, a teacher, you know, like that. So I know that, you know, like most teachers, um, you know, are kind of lucky <laughs> or have, you know, we have two or three, you know, kind of like that. And sometimes it's just one, you know, so I was, you know, I celebrate and admire and she, the person who just like, you know, probably had a really nice time in India and was enjoying himself with Mandarava and got this call from you know, his buddy. Hey, what are you doing? I can just, you know, it's just like that. Hey, what are you doing? And the girl, she, uh, you know, I'm doing, I'm just got my students here and Wanderavas with me and it's going good. And like, what's up with you? Well, I'm stuck here in Tibet. And <laughs> need your help. Yeah, it's a bummer, man. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm sure it's a real situation where Shantarakshita um, is kind of going, okay, calling it in, calling it in, right? Like how many people would respond if you know somebody was calling you from half the world over and saying, you know, I got this Dharma center in Czechoslovakia. You go, good for you. That's nice. And it's going pretty good that we're, you know, don't have time to teach all the yoga. So I'm busy dealing with Czechoslovakian bureaucracy. I, I want you to move here and, and, and teach highest yoga. I sincerely doubt whether Guru Rinpoche spoke Tibetan. Tibetan's a hard ass language. Much harder than Sanskrit, you know, um, or Hindi, you know, it's like Tibetan language doesn't make sense. Would you agree, Dirk? <laughs> it does do Tibetans, but you know, it's like totally, of course, of course. <laughs> so <clears throat> language barrier, cultural barrier. Oh, like that. So there's this incredible love that Guru Rinpoche must have had for his Shantarakshita, because I'm sh I I just cannot believe that he was sitting around going, just waiting for somebody to call me to go to Tibet. I mean, like that, you know. I, I, I from year I get called to go somewhere, and I go, well, you know. 
family and got this mentally health lines are and I'm not going you know so so uh Guram Shea responded to the call right it's really incredible schlep all the way up there you know I had to put up with bureaucratic bullshit before he finally kind of got his groove and um, then spent many years teaching closely um 25 um disciples and um teaching female disciples too. Of course, there are lots of female disciples, but given the current situation, uh, patriarchy and Tibet, you know, they weren't all listed down, but of course, uh, you know, Padmasambhava authorized um, the struggle to teach and had um, many students, right? So when when he went off to Copper Colored Mountain, then uh, she already had a very established Sangha, right? So we know that, um, she was probably the one that really preserved, wrote stuff down, um, told everybody, hey, don't don't just disperse, let's keep meeting. You know, because after uh, a teacher leaves, generally um, people go, well, now, you know, nothing here anymore. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, I guess you'd still go, um, get people together and they stayed in contact. So that's a good one. <clears throat> yeah. So when when I think about Guru Rimshay's day and so sort of different days, you know, Patrakini or whatever day we're doing, really try to get into what what's the real situation that these practitioners went through. Because generally Tibetan style would be archetypal, you know, we're just doing prayers to Guru Rinpoche, right? And relating on an archetypal level. But, um, you know, in this case, um, we're, we're not talking about Vajradhara and Bhagavati, or you know, we're, we're actually talking about real people that, that made their way. And it's really inspiring. So uh, I'd like to stop there and see if there's any comment or making any sense. And then we can do a, maybe a short meditation. The microphone will travel. Um, the situation in India was changing at the same time that Guru Rinpoche left, or was it still stable? Nalanda was still in one piece, and the moguls hadn't. Uh, yeah, it was still, you know, I mean, stable as far as you know, not major invasions. I mean, um, th there's there's always changing dynasties, and there's always tribal warfare and kings and rajas going but yeah um you know back in the eighth century um it was before the, the major invasions yeah we don't know i mean there, there's always going to be minor something that wasn't even recorded there's always troubles but not it wasn't wiped out it wasn't like escaping nalanda and and going up to tibet to escape it wasn't like that that makes sense or he really didn't have to go it was, did he did he come from Gandharva or India or the Gandharvan part of India pardon me the Gandharva did he go from Gandharva or India you probably mean Gandhara Gandhara yeah um that's a good question you know that's I think that's kind of speculative of course India then was kind of much bigger than it is now. It's had, you know, Pakistan, East and West Pakistan, Afghanistan, you know, so um, the speculation that, you know, he came from, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, so that was probably code. And some people think, okay, that was Swat Valley, that was uh, 
northern Pakistan or parts of Afghanistan like that. So he may not have walked, it wasn't like I me, mean, he may not have walked from southern India all the way up, you know, he was already in uh, that, you know, a little bit more upper regions. Are there still relics in the Swat Valley? I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe some people know that. You know, um, so so much, you know, it's covered by sands or it's you know, destroyed or forgotten, things like that. Maybe get the scholars in town could find out. So I don't I don't think there's uh much textual Indian stuff around Guru Shea. I'm not sure there is around that, you know, because he was tending to be outside the uh, monastic institutions. But not, a, not an official, let me put it that way. It was an outside, but not official. Who was his teacher? <clears throat> so in some of the biographies, they list different teachers. And uh, some of the biographies, um, He's like the second Buddha and disappeared on a lotus like that. So um, like us, he had human teachers and taught himself and had non-human teachers, all three. But in, in Buddha Dharma, we we always we always talk about actually human teachers too, right? Was it Tibetan propaganda that uh, kind of gave his story such magic? Um, the Namtar or, or realization stories um, are always going to be, um, you know, somewhat miraculous, right? Because they're pointing to something that um, can't be uh, explained in you know, kind of a linear way. Well, was he so subtle that he operated on a different um, spectrum of of life? I mean, this as a human being or something? Yeah. No. No, he would have. He would have been able to say hi and what's for dinner. <laughs> I think, you know, he obviously had some extraordinary siddhas or powers, right? But um, nothing that um people couldn't develop given the right effort in karmic situation yeah. will you tell us about why his eyes are depicted that way we'll just try it we'll just kind of do that see what happens right? <laughs> so uh there, there are many different versions of course uh jill's pointing out to one where uh, you know, there's just this is just kind of uh, looking straight ahead practice, but it, it's uh, a glance. It's a sense of uh, really, really open. So it's it's not the half hooded kind of look of shamatha, but that complete open quality. But you know. And I don't think you have to go around being bug-eyed, you know, and just kind of. <laughs> Didn't he hide a lot of um, secret teachings and then they're still being discovered? Isn't he the one that? Yeah, Tarama. Yeah. Isn't he yeah, so yeah. There, there's... Uh, um, continuation of the tradition that the uh, Buddha um, would give uh, teachings to the appropriate people at the appropriate time. Um, so with, for some people would, would give foundational teachings and other people would give, would give like Parsana Paramita teachings, other people give Tantra teachings and so forth. So, um, uh, that that got kind of uh, carried on in Tibet, where um, some teachings were, you know, given later at a different time, or some people realized them at a different time, and there are all kinds of things around Dakini script and stuff like that. 
but uh, on a kind of ordinary level, um, most people um, care something and they kind of uh, forget about and tuck it away. And then uh, if they stay on the path, then um, later uh, they go, oh my goodness, you know, like, that's right, you know. So it's, in a way, that's a terma, right? It was hidden from us, even though kind of in plain sight. Um, happens with books, you know, you thought you read something 20 years ago, and now if you pull it out, you're probably going to have a different experience with it. But um, the idea is uh, uh, sometimes in the pillars at Samye, things would be hidden. And I, I'm sure things had to be hidden, you know, into the teachings and stuff like that. But um, they, maybe they're, you know, they'd be rolled up in certain kind of yellow parchment. And there's a whole thing around it. But um, uh, contemporary teratones like um, De Jimimche, of course, the, the teachings have power, so they have legs, right, like that, because of, like mind, Tirama. Just on a personal light, a Tirama could be like, you, you discover like an old card from somebody that you know, was meaningful to you, and suddenly it, it pops in a different way, like that. particularly if they died, you know? Guys have probably had the experience where maybe you've saved a letter or a card and you're kind of going through your stuff and um, you know, someone's card and then passed away. It's powerful, right? Really. So because I like teaching from a realization state, I like pointing to your actual experience, not just the scholarly view of Terma. But um, Tunda Tolku has written a lot on, on Terma teachings like that. And, um, and it's an interesting, you know, sometimes point of dispute. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, conservative schools like Gelug, you know, said, "Okay, enough." You know, some, when Padma Sambhava came along, he kind of said, "Enough already." <laughs> you know, I don't. You know, I was like, "Where's this text from?" You know, so um, he tried to back a lot of things out and. Um, but um, a lot of things actually did get translated during um, Padmasambhava's um, and Shantarakshita's view in Samya in the years afterwards in the first translation. But um, and when the translators came, things from India, there were new texts, right? Things changed in India too, right? I have to remember, like, like if Guru Mshe was teaching things from the 8th century, by the 11th or 12th century, things had also changed in India, right? It wasn't that the uh, old school that didn't really have names, just not the name of the ancient ones, wasn't that they were making anything up. It's just the Indian teachings that kept you know, rolling out. So that's an interesting point of discussion among people, right? <clears throat> so, um, I'm a, I mean, Mama knows what I'm part of a veterans group called Veterans Pack. And uh, one of the things that we've done in that is generally after a, a retreat or a get together, we'll write letters to ourselves and then give them to a facilitator who then at like some time in the, in the future will mail those to us. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's this really great experience because yeah. you don't know when it's gonna come. And of course, it always yeah. seems to show up at the right time <laughs> to see this, this yeah. kind of heartfelt connection with self in those moments. So, like, it's very meaningful that we do have terminals you can go that. We also went yeah. through uh, the, the two founders are Zen uh, teachers and 
they retired in mm. 2018. Mm. And then there's like all this bureaucratic stuff and a loss of money and the organization almost disappeared. And uh, luckily vets are pretty like, tenacious mm. and the like really want to stick together. Yeah. And um, so people kept going. We just had our first uh, veteran leader run uh, river trip. Mm. And so when you tell the story of uh, Padma Sambhava, like it makes me like think in a really heartfelt way about that transition and how hard it was to lose teachers and to lose leaders, but like us sticking together and being determined mm -hmm. um, that it's been able to move forward. And like to think of our ancestors doing that in such a big way where like they're moving countries and they didn't have phones or email or internet. It's very powerful. Thank you. So uh, later, you know, so uh, when I go to Copper Colored Mountain, then uh, some people say, oh, Lama Lama said this, or Rimji said this, and then Patty will whip out her notes. <laughs> and they'll say, where did that come from? <laughs> I wrote that down. <laughs> so, you know. <clears throat> so I'm sure um, some of uh, the Rimji students have, you know, wrote things down, little epigrammatic things, and um, luckily, you know, Shitsorga was kind of a, um, blue factor and, you know, and that kind of interest in sharing the teachings. Of course, all the 25 disciples fanned out and, and shared the teachings too. But there, there are just a few people that uh, you know, decided, okay, we, we've got to kind of keep this going and preserve it, you know? We've got to like, you know, do some catalogs or this has got to go this place, um, you know, so. Luckily, there were a few of those people uh, back during the time of um, I was studying with the Vigadra Like oh, 1971, 1972, or three, you know, people just listening. And, and one of the geek squad said, We need a video recorder and we need to record this. And I told the story before, right? And, you know, everyone's going, we don't have money for that. <laughs> we don't need that. We'll be here tomorrow. You know. So, luckily, there's some some old videotape, which is really interesting, and I'm sure it's been digitalized. So, you know, uh, for some of his students, like of course, all, the majority of Kumbhushe's um, teachings, particularly on Shambhala, are considered Tama. So. Anybody else? Oh, Doug, yes, thanks. Can you say something about his name as the uh, Lotus Born? Yeah. And uh, how does that relate to him still needing teachers? <laughs> <clears throat> well, and, um, uh, Padma Sambhava's story, uh, you know, is generally told as as um, a Namtara myth, so that we can replicate it. Just like in some ways, if you're uh, monastic, you, you know, or or just us, you know, we're, we're replicating Guru Shakyamuni's realization. So um, there is a sense where, of course, uh, when we're looking at um, who we really are and looking at, um, you know, uh, Yeshe, the Yeshe Lama, then uh, we know that it, it it is unborn, right? And that's saying born from a lotus is a way of saying kind of like unborn awareness. So of course it's um, also a feeling, you know, there are times when we feel like, um, of course, when we're, uh, doing deep shamatha and deep masochin that you guys are all doing. Um, we're generally first establishing that we're sitting on a, a lotus, aren't we? So, 
Um, does it feel that way when they're sitting on their bean bag at home? <laughs> does it feel like, oh, it's like the lotus in the middle of a lake? You know, just completely pristine. So it's pointing to that inner experience also. So um, the biographies of Guru and Shea are, are set up so that um, on an inner level, we can replicate um, our life and the realizations. Otherwise, what are we doing, right? We're just worshiping somebody we never meet. No, we want to meet Guru and Shea like that. Is that helpful, Doug? Was he born in a different state than some other lamas? Was he, how do you mean? Uh, was he subconscious? Well, was he already realized? <clears throat> so, um, I, I think, you know, like we're always, when we're talking about anything and Buddha Dharma, you also have to, well, from what perspective are we telling the story? And from what, you know, from what kind of school or what level of practice or realization are we telling the story, right? So, um, you know, then, then it varies depending, you know, what, what the point of telling that story is, you know? So um, from one point of view, I'm, I'm sure just completely had the same experience, you know, we all did, right? And then uh, from another point of view, he also had the same experience with it. So we're always having the experience of um, kind of me, the one on the driver's license with our problems. And then there's also the completely liberated awareness that's happening at the same time. So the stories are you know, gonna kind of weave back and forth. Um, but generally, Nantar uh, are going to try to um, elucidate a life lived from the inside, from, from actual lived experiences that how I like to call it. So from the actual lived experience, you know, like I'm flying right now. <laughs> But, you know, I'm not levitating off the cushion, right? My lived experience, I don't feel all heavy and dragged down. So my lived experiences, I feel flying. But, you know, I don't have to, you know, I don't, I don't have to actually, you know, I don't have to actually demonstrate flying to feel it, right? I just feel it. Maybe you feel the same way. Maybe feeling kind of itchy when we have some lunch soon. <laughs> That's okay too. Yeah. Like, um, <clears throat> so generally, you know, um, Namtar and, and Buddhist life, and ways, you know, we're, we, we pretty much know kind of the ordinary things, at least when someone's still alive. So we're, we're not, um, we're not pointing attention to that. You know, we're, we're not pointing attention just to the um, outer experience, the dualistic outer experience. We're kind of just hammering away on, please pay attention to your inner experience. Good. So maybe maybe we can do like closing prayers a little early. I'd like to thank Jules. Um, uh, you're, you're kind of doing umzi with the blood. It's good with energy, you know, not just drone. No, 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 no. You got emphasis, and that's good. That's, you know, like I was trying to show you doing a guru umshe with a little emphasis, right? Um, there, There is um, no, uh, in practice situations with whatever teacher I've been, there's, there's no lukewarm uma. Like, don't have a lukewarm central channel. Like, you know, if you're going to be cold, be cold. If you're going to be hot, be hot. But don't be kind of, don't do this kind of handshake. <laughs> Just make, you know, make a, a commitment, even if it's like totally wrong. Uh, 
you know, then that's that's seen as um, obviously you know it totally you know bad wrong, but you know coming up with your expression just like jam it, you know, right? Okay. <clears throat> Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chen Rezin, Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instruction to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, the story of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Lo Song Drakpa, I make the request at your holy feet. Okay, so some of you I'll see um, Kala Chakra and then Salon and maybe um, the dedicated few will um, stay for Vajra cleaning. <laughs> like, I'm going to take a little break, then I'll come out and have lunch with everybody. How's that? Oh, good announcements. Good. Yes. Uh, just a friendly reminder that um, no one here gets paid and we're trying to keep the lights on, keep the, sure. the uh, air conditioner running. So if you could uh, please donate, we have a box in the back or there's links online that lines for Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good. Very good. Yeah, we're truly international Sangha, right? Like Portugal. I don't know where someone else is, but um, definitely around the country. Uh, that's kind of cold, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 